If you want your conservative party back, if you're like, but I am a Republican, I've always been a Republican. You're like, your party was consumed by MAGA. Right. It is right. gone. Right. If you want your party back, you must destroy MAGA. And to do that, that's not just not voting for Donald Trump. That's voting for Democrats up and down the ballot until MAGA and election deniers and these perpetual liars are destroyed. Well, folks, you know, there's a there's an election coming up. You may have heard about that. Uh, I'm sure many of you are excited. And if you're not, I need you to be excited. I need you to get excited right now. Uh, and in the process of getting ready for, for this election, um, I, well, I thought it was important to have a conversation about the one thing we don't see a lot of use of this day these days, and that's common sense. Uh, so we have the author of A Return to Common Sense, How to Fix America Before We Really Blow It, my friend, Lee McGowan. Now, you may have seen her uh, from her infamous kitchen uh, and, and the rants from her kitchen table uh, where she passionately explains politics in a very understandable and accessible way. Uh, so Lee is that politics girl, and she brings uh, that insight and that common sense uh, to our conversation. Her work aims to educate and inspire voters to re-engage in the political process uh, in order to create a kinder and more informed society. Hell, what's wrong with that, right? Why can't we be kinder? Why can't we be more informed? Lee McGowan is my guest as we get into a return to common sense with her coming up right after this. Hey, folks, welcome to the Michael Steele podcast. So, you know, you see people on on various platforms and you're like, I really, I really hope I get to meet this person at some point. And I finally got that. Uh, I got that wish come true for me uh, at the awards uh, for the Webbies. Uh, I met Lee McGowan. And I was like, I was like a schoolboy. Lee, welcome to the Michael Steele podcast. Oh, it's been now, I think, what, two years since we've been yeah, hooked up? Yeah, at here? least two years. It might even be three at this point. Like, honestly, when we met, it was kismet because I think you and I were kind of meant to be friends. Yeah. Obviously, in the world that we have connected on, we are no longer on, you know, different sides of the political spectrum. You know what I mean? We found ourselves on the pro-democracy side. Right. Um, but I think we both appreciate that the way that we speak is how regular people listen. So that's it. That's yeah. it. And it was just so genuine. You're so much fun. Um, it just really, it just really focuses the listener's attention. And, and I love that um, when I hear it and see it in people who are, have that ability to just kind of get people to shut up and listen, right? And and you do that. And I like I said, I from the very first TikTok, I was like, oh my, I, I, I'm in love. Here we are. I got and I got <laughs> I got Lee here with me. So you, I'm excited for you. You've got a new book, um, which uh, as I as I told you before we came on, it it reads like your TikTok. It's like you're in the kitchen, just saying, okay, here's the Constitution. Let me let me tell you, Article One. Let me go through it. Right, uh, a return to common sense. Uh, how to fix America before we really blow it. Uh, it's out now, folks. You need to, you know, make sure you grab a copy. Um, tell me about the book. I mean, because this, the one thing I always gravitated to, and largely because of the way my mama raised me, she raised me with this sense of common sense. And she always used to tell me sometimes when I would come home and do stuff, she'd go, she said, yeah, you got book sense, but damn, you got no common sense. You can't figure out how to walk out of a bag that was opened at both ends. And, <laughs> and, and beside the insult, I was like, hmm, let me think about that. But that's that's really kind of how you approach the reader here. It's like, OK, I know you probably have never had a civics lesson. <laughs> and if you did, it was many years ago. Let's walk through the Constitution. <laughs> And let's walk through the Bill of Rights. <laughs> and you 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 attach it to everyday life. Talk to about talk to me about that process for you. Yeah, I think the thing is, is that 
I well, I call the book a political book for non-political people for a reason, right? I did it because I don't think people should feel bad about not understanding politics. I think what have we been told to not talk about our whole lives, right? right. Politics, right? Don't talk about politics at the table. Don't talk about religion. And what are the two things that cause us the most problems in the history of the world? <laughs> politics yep. and religion, right? And we have no idea how to talk about it because we were told not to. And I think when we don't talk about it, it makes it so much easier to take advantage advantage of us because you can't fix something if you don't understand how it works. If you sat down with me and said, Lee, look, the problem with your car right now is the carburetor. And I was like, great. Thank you, Michael. Which part is the carburetor? You know what I mean? Like I would have no idea. And I think most people feel like that. If we say, oh, the reason nothing gets passed in the Senate because of the filibuster and everyone's like, cool. What the hell is that? Right? Like, I don't want people feeling like that. But here's the part. I love that analogy because you know, but this is what people do. They go, you go, oh, all right, so the problem is the carburetor. And they go, oh, okay, thank you. They act like they know yeah. when they don't. And yeah. then what happens, then you say, well, go ahead, take care of it. And then they come back and then the bill comes. And they're like, well, why is this so much money? Well, you told me to fix your carburetor. Well, what's the carburetor? Right, exactly. And it's like, there's the problem, right? Like you didn't know from the beginning. So it was so easy for people who do know to take advantage of you. And that's kind of what happened with politics, right? Like not paying attention to politics doesn't mean politics doesn't affect you. It means you can't affect it, right? So right. I wrote this book for, as a way for people to reconnect with politics um, and with the American experiment, because I always say you can't fix something if you don't know how it works. And I think there's a reason Trump says things like he loves the uneducated, right? It's because it's easier to take advantage of us that way. And I don't want people going into the world being able to be taken advantage of, especially when we see how messed up our politics are. And I want people to be like, actually, we need to fix this. And actually, I want representatives that do that. And so yes. I thought I would set up a book that did that. So the first part of the book is, as you were saying, it's called America 101, right? It is it is the breakdown of what you might have learned in Schoolhouse Rock or you might have learned in high school if you were paying attention and can remember. And the very first part of it, I say, look, if you know all of this, if you know how our laws are made, if you understand the three branches of government, skip this section. It's not for you. But if you're like, oh, maybe I don't know it as well as I could, or maybe I don't really remember it that well, then read this section. It's 20 pages. It's nothing, right? And then the rest of the book goes from that basis. So you now understand all of the basic terms, everything that we're talking about, the constitution, bill of rights, all this kind of stuff. Then I move on to what I call are the six American principles, which are like six things that no matter where you sit on the political spectrum, I think we can agree make America, America. So it doesn't matter if you're a Republican or a Democrat right. or you're an independent or you don't vote. If I said one of these six things and you would say, yeah, that, that feels like an American principle. Like right. number one is America is a land of freedom, right? Most people would say, yes, yep. that makes yep. America, America, that right? makes sense to me. <clears throat> so I wanted to start from somewhere where it didn't matter where you sat. You would say, I agree with these principles. And then I said, Okay, here's why we think that's an American principle based in history. Here's where we went off track. And here's how I think we get back on track. And I wrote it like we're having a conversation because mm -hmm. I didn't want people to be bored. And I didn't want people to check out because we see what happens when people check out. And it's this mess that we're living through right now. Yeah. It, it, you you just you nailed all the all the aspects of the book that I, I picked up on and so I'm just going to look, I had the, the, the privileged folks. I was asked to do a blurb for the book and I was, I was really happy to do it. And, and just to give you my appreciation and a sense of what I took away from the book, this was part of my blurb. I just, you know, just cause you're here and I got to share it with everybody. I'd say common sense is the unsung hero of our, uh, our decision-making the silent guy that often goes unnoticed, but remains an essential element of our daily lives. From the very first moment I watched Lee McGowan TikTok from her kitchen, knocking out authentic riffs on politics, democracy, and failure of politicians, and the failures of politicians, I knew she was all about common sense. And that, for me, is such an important aspect of public service. Because at the end of the day, our public servants are an extension of us. And they, and they, in many respects, bring out 
the good, the better angels of our natures. And they, they hopefully will represent us in an honest way. And in that representation, apply the common sense that as everyday folks, we sometimes either forget, don't have, or grow lazy about. And so when you look around and I look at this period we're in, as you just mentioned, the one thing that strikes me is that not only are citizens not applying common sense, <laughs> but the leaders aren't either. And that's why we find ourselves now frustrated with this enterprise called democracy, you know, uh, or constitutional republic America. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, this is the thing. I think that if you look at my first principle of the book, being America is a land of freedom, the sixth principle is government should be a force for good. And I think that Reagan did us a major disservice when he said the nine worst words in the English language were, I am here from the government and I'm here to help, right? Um, because if you are not looking to help the people, what are you doing in government? You know, there's not really that many government roles in the whole country. If you look at the federal government, which is what my book pretty much focuses on, um, there are only 535 members of Congress that can make federal laws, 535 of them total in the mm -hmm. whole country mm -hmm. that can do this huge job, that have the purse strings for America, that can set our budget, that can make our laws, that can declare war. So we sure as hell shouldn't be putting in yahoos like Marjorie Taylor Greene in one of those seats, right? Like yeah. we need to be more practical about it. We have to be like, yo, it doesn't matter if you went to an Ivy League college or you are a high school graduate. At some point, we need to pick people who have the country's best interest in mind, who actually like the people and who want us to succeed. Um, and not just like be obstructionists all day long, like we're seeing is happening with the 117th Congress, right? Like they're getting nothing accomplished. Well, and, and, and to your point- And people go crazy. Well, but there's very little difference between Josh Hawley and his Yale education right? and Marjorie Taylor Greene and whatever she got. She's got, yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and I'm finding that it's the, the smart people- are the ones who are the worst. I mean, because, I mean, people tend to look up to people who they think are, or maybe actually are smarter than them because you're, you know, more book learned, you have no experience, you're a lawyer, you're a philosopher, and people look at you. But when you got crazy crap coming out of your mouth, mm -hmm. when you're standing there, you know, you know, throwing up a fist sign for, you know, insurrectionists, and then next thing you know, literally two hours later, your ass is running out of the build, building because you're scared to death because you just now stoked these folks and they're now looking for people like you in the building. You just have to stop, sit back and scratch your head and go, how did we get here? And, and, and at which point do you think in the journey that you outline um, that we miss some of the important elements and ingredients to those things that underline uh, who we are as citizens. And, and I, I give a, a good example of when you, you talk about um, freedom in mm -hmm. the book and you, and you reference it to the 15th Amendment, right? And you say, what did freedom mean to the men who passed the 15th Amendment after the Civil War protecting the voting rights of every American citizen, no matter their party, faith, color, or district, but left out gender? So you can see, even in these points in history, there are pieces that don't even get, get it. And so this was then. Yeah. So today you expect us to be at least a little bit more sophisticated, but we're still leaving, leaving up the pieces as we go after transgendered individuals, as we uh, you know, put in place book bans and book burnings. What, what do you see is is sort of causing this sort of lack of common sense or the lack of application of common sense? I feel like a lot of the problems stem from the country's fundamental uh, stagnation in kind of the 70s, right? Like I see um, 
when I talk about the Constitution and what an amazing document it really is, and it really should be given massive credit for being really a forward thinking document because mm -hmm. those men were a period, it's not a period of history that's like zillions of years ago in comparison to where we are now, right? Oh, I yes. understand it's 240, but it feels like, well, they lived, you know, like it was before airplanes and before, you know, like a, just not the world we live in now. And yet they wrote into the Constitution a way to amend it, knowing that we would change, that we would grow, that we would be different than we were back in the day, right? And uh, and that the Constitution and the rules and laws of our land would have to change with us. And for a long time, we did do that. So we passed something like the 15th Amendment, which allows for the enfranchisement of Black men, but it left out women, white women, Black women. We were still not allowed to vote, right? But over time, we finally get to the 19th Amendment and women get the right to vote. And although progress is slow, we were progressing. Right. And then we stopped in the 70s. The, like The 70s are the last time we had an amendment, right? So the Constitution stopped growing with us. And so we started regressing. And I believe that's because there that's were people that were like, I don't love this idea of all these people having the same rights as me. I don't love this idea of expanding civil rights, expanding workers' rights. There are people in this country that would love to go back. When they say make America great again, it's applying a time where America was great. And you'd have to say, for whom? For whom well, was it great? I would say right? I would say they are applying it to a time that actually never existed. Yes, it's it's an imaginary time in their heads. Because remember, the 1950s was presented to us by this new industry in this new invention called television. Yep. So everyone had this sort of idealized view of what suburban America, this new emerging community, would look like. You know where. Daddy got up, put on his hat and had his suit and his white shirt and his black tie. And he walked out the door, kissed the wife, then walked out the door, pat the kids on the head and off to work he went. Mom is at the door in her little apron, but fully dressed with pearls, right? Because that's how mom got up in the morning, right? The kids all well behaved, sat down, ate their breakfast. Oh, thank you, mom. Grabbed their lunch and went off to school. End of the day. They come home waiting for dad to return. They're at the front door. Dad, come, you know, it's something like. Yeah, bring him a cocktail, do the thing. Then? Everyone lives in a white picket fence. And you know what? There was a group of people that did get that. And we were all in, and we, we were all told we could have one salary and vacations and a lifelong pension. And, you know, we leave with a gold watch after 40 years. There's kids today in Gen Z. They're like, what are you talking about? Like that right. has never been their reality, right? right. We stopped we stopped evolving as a people. We should have expanded that American dream to everyone. And that's what we were trying to do with civil rights and with women's rights and saying like a woman can buy a home and a woman can have a credit card. And, you know, we can have black people in our colleges and we can have, we were supposed to be expanding and growing and becoming this nation that provided these opportunities that we told the world we gave to people to everyone. I and there was a group of people who didn't want that for everyone. And that's what we're seeing regress now. I, I I I I love what you what you said there about the we stopped we stopped expanding in the seventies and the Constitution stopped with it and so the contraction began. The last major amendment put forth there were two. I worked on one of them. Uh, one was D.C. statehood uh, back in the seventies. I worked on that um, in the office of. Uh, uh, then uh, member uh, from D.C., Walter Fontroy. Yeah, and we're still other, waiting on that one. Yeah. Yeah. And the other was the ERA, the Equal Rights Amendment. Yeah. <laughs> still uh, waiting and, on that one, Michael. And we, watched, we watched that amendment go uh, go away uh, in, in such, I mean, it got out there and it just, it literally, you watched it die on the vine. You were die like, on the vine. Um, <laughs> it just died on the vine. And I have to tell you, as a young man, I was conflicted about what it meant or what it would mean. Um, was it elevating one one group over another? So there were a lot of big questions, but the country decided we don't even want to address the question because this idea that we have to now say that women are equal. We just we what I tell you what, why don't we go to lunch and then we'll come back and we'll talk about that. And yeah, we, and we'll it, talk about we, it. And we're in 2024 now, what? where <laughs> where every you know every red state in America has the ability to strip rights from women because we don't have equal rights under the law. You right. can make laws that apply only to one gender because we never got the ERA. 
You know, and so you see people talking about uh, if we elect the Harris Walls ticket and they return the rights of Roe to people. And there are people in the abortion space that are like, that's not enough. Roe was always a compromise. We shouldn't be under the control of other people's decisions. Women right. should be able to make their own decisions with their doctor. And you say, yes, but everything has to take place within its time. So we revert, return the rights of Roe to people and then we pass the ERA. Yes. Because if we get the ERA passed, a lot of these state laws that really just only attack women wouldn't be legal because you couldn't just have a law that only applied to women. And I think these are things that we have to start thinking about because our country really just stopped evolving. And what happens if you stop evolving, right? You see that little slug crawling out of this the water and growing get. its little legs. This is what you get. This we got to keep moving like. forward. You evolve or you die. Well, I love, I love, um, the, the, in the first part of the book, you, you kind of walk through all of this and you lay it out and, and, the one area that I thought was very important and telling, particularly given what we see, the bullshit we see happening right now with what used to be an incredibly good platform uh, known as Twitter, but now it's it's X and, and it is it is an absolute hellscape uh, of ugliness and hatred and vile behavior. And lies. I, to, I just said, you know, you know what strikes me just as a quick side note? I was scrolling through my Twitter feed and the level of porn that's just popping up in the for you portion of it. Like, really? What that? What are you doing, Elon? So you, you have this whole and he's out there talking about we do this for free speech. Yet and still, you're kind of managing what actually is free speech because there's certain people who are not allowed to platform the way you like them to. But you note in the book, freedom of speech is the is in the First Amendment of the Constitution and is the one Americans often base their national identity on. I'm an American. I have freedom of speech. The problem is most people think freedom of speech means you're allowed to say whatever you want to say whenever you want to say it, and no one can do anything about it. What people forget is that the Constitution was written to shape the power of the government not necessarily the behavior of the citizens. I thought that that that's such a smart point. You go on, we built this country on the idea of independence, that we are our own nation, our own people, but we transpose that national identity onto the individual. The idea of freedom of speech is so integral to the American sense of self, but we're often a little fuzzy on the details of the actual amendment and what it really means. People don't know. The courts have limited free speech, right? You and I yeah, can't you. can't go to a Starbucks and start yelling fire, scaring people, having them eat, you know, injured and all this other stuff. So it is how we interpret the the rights that we have, how we understand them. And that really relates back to what you were saying about how the expansion of the country resulted in an expansion of the constitution. It was a better understanding of what these rights really meant. And that came about by applying common sense. It's essential, right? I mean, that's the thing we have forgotten uh, common sense. And it's not just about uh, the thing about freedom of speech is I often say people think I'm allowed to say whatever I want to say whenever I want to say it. And you're like, yes, it's freedom from government control, but it's not freedom from accountability, right? right? You can't just, you know, call your coworker the N-word and not get in trouble at work. You can't be like, well, that's my freedom of speech. You're like, yeah, but there's going to be rules at your workplace. You can't just do that. There's accountability right. to our actions. And I feel like as Americans, we've often forgot about accountability. And it happens a lot with things like X, with things like Fox News, with our media landscape now, post-fairness doctrine, Reagan, you know, years, mm -hmm. that you can kind of say anything about anyone now blatant lies that we see from everything from Springfield, Ohio, saying they're eating the dogs and the cats. They're not even legal when it's all completely <laughs> false, right? It's to crazy. what's going on with the poor hurricane victims who are absolutely being helped by FEMA, by the Biden government, by everything that's happening. And yet you would think online that, you know, immigrants were slitting people's throats in the hurricane lands and stealing FEMA money. And because that's what they're allowed to say, because there's zero accountability right now. And these are things that common sense, we have to say, this isn't working for us. We can't live right. in two separate realities because clearly it's going to, it's going to cause a civil war and we cannot have that. But one political party is absolutely pushing 
the lies um, and to the point where J.D. Vance wouldn't do the vice presidential debate if they were going to fact check him. Right? right. And when they did fact check him right at the beginning, he said they had to cut their mics. And he was like, Margaret, you said you weren't going to be fact checking. Right. Like right. he was terrified right. that his whole plan to lie to the American public the entire time, which is what he did, was going to be usurped by actual truth. Right. Donald Trump just pulled out of a 60 minutes interview that he, every presidential candidate has done for the past 50 years. Right. Kamala Harris is doing because they were going to fact check him. We have to get to a point now where we're like, oh, are we just OK with being a post truth nation? Because that's not going to work for us. You can't build an economy if you don't believe in facts. You can't build a space shuttle if you don't believe in facts. Right. You can't fix a disease if you don't believe that the doctors are telling you the truth. We can't live in a post-truth world. It's dangerous to us. And anyone using their common sense has to find that scary. But it's not a but it's not an e a level or equal playing field for the application of common sense either. So you no. just referenced uh, the fact that Donald Trump, the big chicken that he is, has pulled out of the 60 minute debate. How much how much clatter, chatter, noise do you hear from the press about that? Oh, like nothing. Now imagine if if Monday, Tuesday, whatever day next week, Kamala Harris says, I'm pulling out of the debate, out of out of the 60 minute interview. Yeah. What do you think would happen? And that's we would hear nothing about we would hear nothing other than she's terrified, she won't do press, she won't talk to the press. It's a completely um unbalanced playing field, as you were saying. Right. And and so for me, common sense is also uh the application, like you like you just said, to er in areas of accountability. Uh, behavior, responsibility. It's it's not just it's not just doing the thing, but it's understanding how the thing is connected to everything else you do. And yeah. a lot of what ha often happens is those those links are broken. So I'm curious, what are some of the key things you think um, that Americans need to start doing? now to begin to return to some sense of common sense? I think we need to ask ourselves a bunch of hard questions. I think that's one of the reasons that, uh, you know, I wrote the book in such a common sense way, in such a normal conversational way, mm -hmm. because it, it, it allows us the moment to ask ourselves hard questions. Do are we okay if one side is okay being fact check and the other side refuses, right? Are we okay with news networks that would rather pay hundreds of millions of dollars in lawsuits than telling us the truth? Political party aside, what does it mean if one side knows they cannot win a debate or cannot do an interview without being able to lie? What does that tell us? Because, you know, denying the truth doesn't mean truth doesn't exist, right? You can mm -hmm. say it didn't rain at your inauguration, but like, <laughs> <laughs> bro, it was raining, right? Like we can't live in that world. And I think people need to ask themselves the hard questions. Like, even if this is my team, is that what I want to do? I've often said with the, you know, the different states changing facts, depending on what they want to teach. We're going to teach both sides of the Holocaust. We're going to teach the gay people don't exist. We're going to teach the Bible in classrooms. It's like, okay, but can your children compete Right. on the global world, right. even in the country, if we all learned real facts and you learned Florida facts, right? Like right. that's not going to work. And you have to ask if that's the best thing for your children. You might be inconvenienced by the facts, you know, but does it serve you? If you got really sick, would you be like, well, I'd rather the doctor lie to me and tell me I don't have cancer because that's what I'd rather hear. Or would you rather hear the truth, right. deal with the truth, and then ask the experts who could best help you to solve the problem. And I think that's the question people need to really start asking themselves because where we're living right now, there are three different sets of truths. There's the right-wing truth, there's the left-wing truth, and then there's kind of the truth. And I think we need to get back to asking ourselves, how do we get back to that? And I think a lot of that has to do with government. Again, I think people think I'm not going to pay attention to government. Government doesn't affect me, but actually government affects every part of your life. And that's from how fast you can drive to if your streetlights come on at night to if we have laws around lying to us um, in the media. And I think we need new laws. And I yeah. think common sense tells us that, that if you are lying to us, it shouldn't just be civil lawsuits from, you know, Dominion voting that get mm -hmm. Fox News. It should be a government lawsuit that says you can't 
actively lie to the people for profit. And I think most people should be behind that because they can see that what we're doing now isn't working. And that's where the common sense part comes in. Uh, Lee McGowan, this is, uh, this, this is why I love her, folks. It, it <laughs> is, it is, it's, just, it's just so good. The book is A Return to Common Sense, How to Fix America Before We Really Blow It. We're going to take a quick break. and we come back, we're going to apply a little bit of that common sense to what we see happening right now in the political landscape with 30 days before the United States elects its next president. We'll be right back right after this. Hi folks, Michael Steele here. Now, you know when things get crazy busy and you find you don't have much time left over at the end of your day, certainly not for healthy home cooked meals. Well, fortunately for me and for you, there's HelloFresh. HelloFresh delivers all the pre-portioned ingredients you'll need to make easy homemade meals. All the proteins, veggies, sauces, spices, and so much more arrive in your box along with simple instructions that walk you through each step in the cooking process. Now, you can choose meals that match you and your family's lifestyle with preferences like fit and wholesome, quick and easy, or vegetarian. You'll always find something to love from HelloFresh. From hearty dinners to game day snacks, HelloFresh has a variety of recipes and flavors to perfectly accompany sweater weather. We see you, pumpkin spice. You know I love you. And I also love HelloFresh and have been using it going back many years. Get 10 free meals at HelloFresh.com slash free steal. Applied across seven boxes. New subscribers only. Varies by plan. That's 10 free HelloFresh meals just by going to HelloFresh.com slash free steal. That's HelloFresh.com slash F-R-E-E-S-T-E-E-L-E. Go there today for HelloFresh, America's number one meal kit. Personally, I'm sick of the perpetual conversation about women in this nation. What is a woman? What are we good for? What rights do we get? Are we innately worthy or worth less? So far in this election season, we have been told that Kamala Harris was an idiot who slept her way to the top, then a master manipulator who single-handedly wrecked the country and ran into the ground, untrustworthy and annoying because she laughs, less than because she isn't a mother, and when we pointed out she was a stepmother, of less value because she hadn't actually given birth. We were told she only won the debate because her sorority sister was a moderator, that she was using an earpiece, that she had the questions ahead of time. Much like all the women who came before her, this idea that she might have just been smart and prepared didn't even enter into the conversation. Now we have her opponent calling her mentally disabled and his running mate who clearly just hates women doing an event with a well-known preacher who has been out there publicly calling her a witch, claiming she is using witchcraft to seduce the people. So we have gone through every female trope and name in the book and we are back at witchcraft. Seriously, when is enough enough? When will women in this country just get the respect to simply be judged on our merits? Why do we continue to have to fight this uphill battle against the perception of our sex with its ridiculous moving target of expectations? To be clear, I'm not voting for Kamala Harris in November because she's a woman. I'm voting for Kamala Harris because as a woman, I believe I'm safer and better off under her leadership, that she is the far better candidate and the country will thrive under her command. So join me in voting for the Harris Walls ticket this November, not only to break the glass ceiling, but to allow those shards to fall and sever the offensive and limited storylines of who and what a woman should be in American society. Because I am dead tired of it. And I can only imagine you are too. Ladies and gentlemen, that is my guest, Lee McGowan, the politics girl. Yeah, she's, just, she's got opinions, Michael. She's got, she's got some opinion. opinions. Oh, but folks, from the kitchen, from the kitchen, um, the kitchen table, if you will, where where common sense is applied every day. Uh, that that riff on Kamala Harris and and how she's being troped up by um, not just the politics of the right. But even by the media itself, um, in many instances, really goes to the heart of what, you know, a return to common sense, your new book that we've been discussing is all about. Because in that in that clip, we hear common sense. <laughs> we've got here we are, folks. We've got we've just gone the, the gamut of the, the tropes that that are that are applied to women. Right. Uh, all the things about their sexuality and their sex to being a witch. I, I, that just, I watched that arc of common sense applied in, in what you were saying there. 
How did you get, how did you, before I get into a little bit more meat on, on the politics side of that, I just, the first time you did that, was it just, you know, I am just so damn mad and pissed off at the crazy shit that this is what I just got to, you told your husband, just turn the camera on. Let me say a few things. How did, yeah because is that, is that, because it kind of, it feels like that's something that folks just have in their gut at the kitchen table and they're just like, okay, ah, here it is. Yeah, no, if you live with me, that's pretty much what you get, right? <laughs> and I think at the time, uh, my poor husband, we were stuck at home during the pandemic when I reimagined this uh, event. And I think I was just following him around the house doing that. And at one point he turned to me and he was like, baby, I love you. But if we're going to make it through this pandemic, you cannot bring all this just to me. And I was like, well, where am I supposed to put it? We're trapped in this house. And he was like, I don't know, baby, put it on TikTok or something. And I thought, TikTok, my God, like I'm not a dancing teenager. I can't floss, you know, like. Mm -mm -mm. And uh, and so I just put the camera in my windowsill where I was standing and I did the whole speech just to the windowsill. And it, I think it was about uh, Amy Coney Barrett being jammed through at the last minute and people right. saying, oh, the Democrats have to stack the court. And I was like, the court's already stacked. Like, that's a done deal. They did it. It's stacked. Like, we already know which way they're going. And uh, that was my first one. And I swear to God, Michael, I was in my pajamas at the time. I used to call them breakfast rants because I was really standing in my kitchen in my pajamas. And by the time I got up to 100,000, 200,000 people watching, I thought, well, I should probably put some clothes on. Well, I put some clothes and, on. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I mean, I used my own common sense. And I thought, oh, lady, God, put that... some put some clothes on and some mascara, perhaps. And <laughs> that's where it went. And now, you know, we're up at 2 million plus followers. And I'm like, that's exciting. Not just for me, but for the fact that there's that many people that care about breaking down political issues, yeah. about it, understanding things in bite-sized pieces. You know, I think I'm able to... Uh, say what people are thinking, or yep. I'm able to put into words what people can't quite do, right? You They're do. like, ah, that you part, do. that part, that's what I was yes. thinking. And they yes. had that fight with their dad at the dining room table, or they were trying to talk to their hairdresser about it, and they didn't quite know what they wanted to say. And then I say it, and they can just forward it. That's really why I made these short pieces. So you can share it with people and say, this is what I was trying to say. This is what I was talking about. This is what's bothering me, because it opens up a conversation. And yeah. then when I built the book, you know, I built the podcast, obviously, which you've been on numerous times, which yep. was a deeper dive into issues, but in the same conversational way. And then I did the book as a way for people to say, ah, this is what I was thinking. And like, we can fix this. I want people to understand that there's going to be plenty of time for us to disagree on political issues again. But that's after we've saved the country from like rising fascism on a dying planet, right? right. It'll just be a lot easier to do with a functioning government that's not in the middle of a religious war, right? So that's what I want people to know right now, that we have problems. We're always going to have problems. We're humans. But if we want to solve them, we can't get rid of the one form of government that would allow us to do that. Right. And that's where I want us to be coming into November. No, I, I think you I think that is so smart and it's so uh, spot on. And it's been a, a big part of my frustration as someone who's been inside the political process, um, yeah. been in the battles as, you know, folks who listen to me know, county chairman, state chairman, national chairman, candidate, all that crazy stuff. Yeah. And you, you begin to see and you, and you start to realize as you go through the process, which is why I, I asked the question the way I did earlier, that uh, people start are losing pieces of their mind along the way. And what I realize is that the, the, the institution of politics is actually built now and designed to do that, to dumb yeah. you down enough as a citizen that you don't see the stupid and the crazy as stupid and crazy. You just see it as, oh, I guess that's just part of the politics. And you, you, you've got folks like me and you out there screaming, time out, no, no, that's no, that's not it. That's not what free speech means. That's not what the Second Amendment means. That's not how we govern ourselves. How we, So when you look at what's happening right now, how do you apply the, the, the sort of the common sense approach when you see um, the Harris Walls campaign uh, in what was given it was roughly 107 days to put up a national campaign for the presidency. Yeah. And we are now in like day 77 of that, of that 107 days. How do you see that campaign uh, evolving the way it has from the very moment um, it was launched 
Um, and, you know, 100,000, 300,000 people said, sign me up uh, yeah. to where it is today, where instead of being behind, it's ahead in many of the national uh, poll polls, the ones that are looking at likely voters. Y'all know if you listen to me, if you're looking at registered voters, I'm going to hit you upside the head because that's not a real poll. But we, I digress. Um, how do you see it right now? Well, I think you use the right word, right? Evolution. It's what I was talking about with our constitution too, and the way our country kind of stopped evolving. I think one of the most exciting things about the Harris Walls campaign is like you said, they were given such a limited time to bring up a campaign. I mean, Trump's been running since 2021, right? Like he started his campaign fundraising the day he was inaugurated. Like it's just continually running. Kamala Harris hasn't been running for president since the just since the end of the July. And right. I think what she did was evolve the way we run a presidential campaign, which has made a lot of the people in the old school traditional media angry because there she's not doing all the old fashioned things. She's talking to social media people. She's doing Call Me Daddy, the podcast, right. which is the number two podcast. Tell me a presidential campaign that would have done that in the past. She knows that she needs to reach the people where they are, which I think the Biden campaign also knew. I was invited to the White House at the very beginning of the Biden-Harris administration because they were like, you guys are the people that the people are listening to now. Right. So how do we reach them where they are? Because we want to talk to the people and we know they're not watching, you know, CBS or ABC News at 7 p.m. Right. every night to get their news. So they were trying to evolve the way politicians speak to the people. And I think Kamala Harris has just supersized that, right? She had a short amount of time and she has done a completely different way of raising money, of asking for votes, of telling people who she is. And she gets a lot of criticism for that. They're like, well, she doesn't do enough interviews and we need to know more about her policies. You're like, read her website, bro. Like if they're all right there, you know what I mean? What she's doing is connecting with voters. I think it's hilarious. Like we care so much about policy. Tell me how Donald Trump plans to round up a hundred million immigrants. You know what I mean? Every right. time they're asked that question, no answer to that question. And it's know, armed people I'm, coming I'm, into your cities. I'm, no one wants that. Show me your I'm paper sorry, bullshit. Lee, I'm sorry. You are absolutely incorrect on that. He oh, has a, he has a concept of a plan. <laughs> Jeez. But what I'm saying is she's has, reimagined a, it. The, the man his has concept, a concept of a plan. Of a plan. So yeah. That, so he's ready to be president of the United States on day one with a concept of a plan now what says that the man who's already done the job like it is embarrassing <laughs> exactly, exactly. but listen here's the thing let me ask you this michael do you think that the powers that be because donald trump is not the powers that be donald trump works for donald trump he's right. running to stay out of jail right. you know do you think the powers that be really are going to have donald trump be president because i don't i think that what we saw at that vice presidential debate this man that was able to take off one skin and put on another for the moment and be whoever he needed to be in that moment and seem reasonable and normal and calm and lie just through his teeth about every single policy, every yep. single idea yep. he's ever had. I think that's their boy because Donald Trump knows who he is and J.D. Vance will be exactly who you want him to be. And the powers that be of the Heritage Foundation and the Federalist Society and these people that already changed our court system to benefit the sort of Christian nationalist idea ideology. Um, they want to do that for our whole society. And that's what Project 2025 is. That's what J.D. Vance wants to bring to us. And Donald Trump is merely the vehicle, I think, to take yeah, the base he, across the finish line. From a political standpoint, he he has always been the vehicle, which is why you have seen so many people who you would have thought uh, kicked him out of the car or just run the vehicle off the road because it was right? not the best thing to be driving decided to continue to drive it because along the way they would pick up a lot of crazy people who would like blindly say yes, you know, and create these images of Donald Trump like Jesus Christ and Moses. And so they knew we got you and to the money, they would, they would be able to grift whatever we can. I mean, you got, you have a presidential candidate who's out here not hawking a plan to, to reform uh, healthcare or to uh, create a sustainable uh, economy or to deal with environmental issues. No, he's hawking $100,000 watches, Bibles, tennis shoes, and menthol cigarettes for some damn reason. He thinks black people like to smoke the menthol cigarettes while they're wearing oh those gold God. lame shoes. So there's that, that, that bitch stupid. So anyway, 
you've got all of these things and the party has bought that. They, it became this symbiotic thing where they figured they could use each other. Yeah. And that's effectively what they've done. So yes. in the course of all of that, now, you know, the Marco Rubio's and the Josh Hollies thinking they'll pretend to be pretenders to the throne. They'll throw up a fist or they'll say stupid ass shit about Donald, you know, about something Donald Trump said in supporting it, thinking that that's going to ingratiate them with the base. The base said no. No. And J.D. Vance was the guy. J.D. Vance, J.D. Vance was handpicked by Eric and Donald Trump Jr. What does that tell you? What does that tell you? That's well, to the- me, it tells me, listen, to me, it tells me that was very stupid of them because I think if their father stands too close to a window, if they get elected, he won't be in power anymore. But it also <laughs> says that Peter Thiel has a lot of power. Peter Thiel has a lot of money. Elon Musk has a lot of money. And they are supporting the J.D. Vance candidate. And the Trumps are at the bottom line grifters. That's and it. whatever comes with the money, they will take they will without take. thinking through what they're taking. And so that's that has been the core play in the last 18 or so months in the yeah. run up to putting J.D. Vance in power and play. It has been the combination of the, the rise of Elon Musk uh, and giving him the level of influence within the party. When you have conservatives embracing that stupid, you know, you've gone you've gone beyond cray cray. So now yeah. then the other side, you got the money. You got the piece that Peter Thiel kind of uh, back ends with reinforces with the cash that he puts out there. And so 2028 and beyond, even 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 in this cycle, um, it's, not, it's not even so much what happens if Donald Trump wins or loses. It's what they are have already set in motion. Yeah, that is going to be the game going forward, which is why I say to a lot of folks who you know hold on dearly to the party, um, we've got to let it go as it is. But in the process of letting it go, we just beat the shit out of it. We create yeah. we create the 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 faction within it to have that fight, just as just as the Republicans did with the Whigs to emerge to become the Republican Party. This fight will will occur and something better will emerge out of this Republican Party. And so that's that's the setup play and the lines are being drawn. The players are being leveled up. So it's then importantly, when you see someone like Liz Cheney coming out and endorsing Kamala Harris, what does that say to you when you're looking at the political landscape and then begin to see some of these movements uh, by Republicans like her. Now, you know, I'm already, everybody knows where I am. I, I was there four years ago. I figured this stuff out a long time ago and said, okay, yeah. y'all need to stand over here because this is where democracy is. Yeah. It's not there, it's here. But now people, people are coming on and we've worked behind the scenes to create the permission structure uh, for, uh, in fact, the Liz Cheney's and others to sort of, get you know stand in that space but then more importantly for rank and file everyday americans center right conservative moderate republicans who are fed up with watching the party deteriorate but feel they have no place to go maybe you do yeah and i think you saw a lot of that at the dnc there was a lot of republicans that spoke on the dnc stage and the general consensus was if you vote for a Democrat in this election, it doesn't make you a Democrat. It makes you a patriot, right? The idea is, do you believe the American experiment should continue or not? Because under Donald Trump, J.D. Vance, Project 2025, it will not. It will consolidate the federal government around one person, making us about as close to what we removed ourselves from with our independence as possible. Mm-hmm. It's basically a monarchy. We will completely can take over the Justice Department and you know, attack our political enemies and put them in jail. And we're going to round up people completely antithetical to freedom and put them in camps and deport them. But show me how you're going to mass deport people, please. It's going to be a giant open air prison system that's a work camp. Like, I don't think we can pretend any otherwise. We're not going to bring in a bunch of planes and fly people to Haiti and fly people to North Korea and fly. uh, Come on, we're not doing that. Um, So we have to be realistic about all those things. And I think that 
it's just very important that people realize the moment we're in, that if you have Dick and Liz Cheney on the same side as Bernie Sanders, something has gone really wrong with the other side. Mm -hmm. And what you're speaking to, this idea that if you want your conservative party back, if you're like, but I am a Republican, I've always been a Republican. You're like, your party was consumed by MAGA. It is right. gone. Right. If you want your party back, you must destroy MAGA. And to do that, that's not just not voting for Donald Trump. That's voting for Democrats up and down the ballot until MAGA and election deniers and these perpetual liars are destroyed. And then you can build a wonderful conservative party out of that. Because right. like I said, there's going to be plenty of time for us to disagree about 25% tax rates versus 31% tax rates. And do we have, you know, wealth taxes on people that made this much money? Or do we have, you know, public school systems that are funded this way? We can have those discussions again, but not if the government itself no longer works mm -hmm. because we gave the power to a wannabe autocrat and his oligarch backers. We have to be smart about that. And people like Liz Cheney and Dick Cheney and Adam Kinzinger, and those people are smart about that. Even Mitt Romney, if he's being quiet, you know he's on the other side. Somebody right. said the other day that the new silent majority is Republicans who just aren't telling other Republicans that they won't be voting for Trump. Right. That's the new silent majority. I, 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 I not only do I agree with that, I, I know that to, to in fact be a real thing. Um, I, I have a piece up right now on MSNBC Daily where I talk about the intentional voter. It's a group of voters that you've heard them and you ask them a question about, oh, you know, you know, I, I intend I intend to vote. And then it just kind of drifts off into not sure what <laughs> or who. Or yeah, the, what, because they don't want to alienate themselves from their church or their right, neighbors or their army right. buddies or whoever. Exactly. Yeah. And then and then the other side of it is uh, of that intentional voter is the one who who says, well, I just yeah, I have no intention to vote this year. I just don't want I don't want to be a part of it because I don't. And what's happened and this goes back to the first part of our conversation where we talked about Kamala Harris bringing sort of bringing people in. And, and sort of drawing them in um, yeah. from the moment she uh, uh, was announced, uh, well, the moment Joe Biden said, hey, this, this, is, this is the new nominee of the party, she's been able to draw these folks. And so those intentional voters who are not, by the way, captured in polling, are not considered uh, in the process. And, and, and this is why I say states like Florida, North Carolina, given all the batshit stuff that's going on there in North Carolina with, with Mark Robinson and, and Georgia, and given what's being done there to undermine the vote there, those states are in play because of these voters. The very ones you're talking about, the silent majority who aren't, just like in 16, where people weren't saying they were voting for Trump or went in the polls and did it, Folks are now going, um, you know, I'm not saying anything. I, you know, I'll let you assume I'm voting for Trump or I'll let you assume whatever you want. And they're going to do something different. And I think yeah. that's that's a landscape for the Harris Walls campaign for them to play effectively, which is why what you mentioned before about the platforms that she's reaching out to the the podcast and, the you know, going on you know, uh, late night television, talking to small town reporters are reaching people through unconventional measures and means in a way that I still don't think the conventional thinkers understand or fully appreciate. And they no, probably I, won't I until after so. the election. And said to go, exactly. Well, how the exactly. hell did she win? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Because she reached out to the actual voters. She didn't play the old school media game. Right. And I think that's important. I, I sat across the table on a CNN roundtable with a, a Republican strategist who's still a very hardcore I Republican saw that. strategist. Yes, yes. And she was saying she was saying, you know, listen to Kamala Harris at the border. She sounds like a Republican. And I said, that should thrill you. <laughs> Don't you want to vote for her? <laughs> because it's like if she's saying all your policies, what's you know, like what's yeah, the problem? Right. All of a sudden, like, that's a bad thing. But that goes to your point: that Republican Party is dead. So, yes. So now you it's got just MAGA. common sense policies. It's common sense. So MAGA is now looking at the common sense, you know, narratives and policies that Republicans once put out and go. Oh, she sounds like a Republican as if that's a bad thing. Right. And I'm like, no, that's the whole point. It's a good thing. Yeah. So.
Leave it Listen, I, I think I think honestly, at the end of the day, I started the Politics Girl Project because no one in my life really cared about politics. And I knew that things were going off the rails and I wanted to talk about it, but I would see my eyes, my friend's eyes glaze over when I did. And I think sometimes we were so busy living in a democracy that we forgot that we had to work in our democracy. Yeah. And now that things are a giant mess, we're like, we need to do something. And that is where I wanted to start from with this whole project. And it's where I've gone to now. And I think most people are waking up to that now. And that feels very exciting for both our democracy and for the future health of our country. You are, you are, you are not only doing it, but you're doing it with common sense. And I, I love it. Uh, I am a fan and I, I love, I love people who just keep it real and bring realness to their conversations because out of everything else that's going on, you need to look to a neighbor, a friend, a family member and realize they're telling you the truth. They're not, there's no incentive for them to lie to you. There's no incentive for them to uh, misguide you or provide you disinformation. Uh, and you help with that. You, you said a little bit ago, you, you know, you wanted to do these little vignettes and give them to people so they'd have a way to express what they felt they couldn't express. Right. Uh, and you do that. I want you to continue to do it. I love the book, A Return to Common Sense, How to Fix America Before We Really Blow It. Grab a copy, folks. Um, follow Lee on TikTok. Follow here for as well on, um, on Twitter, X, whatever that platform is, at I Am Politics Girl. Uh, Lee McGowan, one of the best. I appreciate you. Thank you for having me, Michael. I really appreciate you as well. Ah, well, thank you. And folks, uh, thank you for taking a moment to spend some time with us and the politics girl, Lee McGowan, uh, here on the Michael Steele podcast. Uh, as you know, go out, tell a friend, definitely tell a friend. Lee, share this with your, your folks in your universe. You got a hell of a lot more folks than I do. So you... <laughs> You, you you can go touch some of your friends. My friends, we over here in the corner, we're trying to break out. So help us break out. Tell a friend, share it, give it a review on Apple Podcasts, whatever you need to do there. Certainly uh, follow us on Twitter uh, at Michael Steele, at Steele underscore podcast. Uh, and certainly you'll find us here at The Bulwark Online. Love this new platform. This family has been so good to me, um, as have all of you. So thanks again. Until next time, fall is here. And you know, you got to get the warm and fuzzy heels on, get that uh, little cider, put a little something extra in it. Don't. <laughs> don't, you know you're going to get it from grandma, right? You know grandma's going to be the one say, hey, baby, why don't you put a little bit of this in your cup? Just Keep so you can... warm, Michael. We want to keep you warm. Keep you warm. Keep you warm. All right, guys, take care until next time. <laughs>